it, it's, it's a great opportunity to be here, but it's also a great challenge that I take very seriously. And Charlotte mentioned that one of the things I have done uh, uh, within the last year was develop a 30-hour elective for the students coming through the War College. And during those 30 hours of contact, I really only touch on some of the issues with cyberspace. So boiling that down to about 45 minutes is going to be a challenge that really can't be met. So what I really want to think about this as being as setting the foundation for a dialogue that will continue after the break when we do the questions and, and answer on that. So some of you may know that, uh, in fact, again, this is this, this to state it more succinctly. And by the way, I will be reading. I understand that some of these, the fonts on the slides will get small even within this venue. And since it's also being recorded for YouTube, I'll break one of the presenters' uh, rules and, and sometimes read off my own slides just so everyone can, can see it and, uh, and understand uh, uh, what's going on there. But again, the best I can do in about a 45 minute time is, or 50 minute time is to provide an appreciation for, this, for the broad scope of complexity of all the opportunities and challenges because it's a dual edged sword. There's opportunities and there's risks and there's threats that are out there that face uh, uh, the global community and that are presented by cyberspace in there. And I also have to say up front that the information I'll pre that, that I will be presenting today is my own. It is not necessarily uh, the, the represent the views of the U.S. Army War College, the U.S. Army, or the Department of Defense. So that's my, my disclaimer there. This, this past weekend, I, being a fan of uh, the print media still, look, just looked at the local papers and the Patriot News and the Sentinel and said, well, what's in there about cyberspace? Well, I, I didn't have to go far because if you looked at Saturday's uh, pa uh, Patriot News, above the fold on the front page, Google privacy policy raises concerns. Okay, uh, go to um, go to the Sentinel, and again, this is in, a, in the business section, but above the fold again, the push for privacy. Obama administration seeks online privacy rule. Okay, and then maybe not something you think about a little bit, a little bit more buried in the E section here, in the health section of the of the uh, Patriot News again, though. Remote controlled chip implant delivers. Bone medication. What's that got to do with cyber? It's a little bit louder. Okay, I'll talk. Is that better? Okay, okay. I'll, I'll be getting to that later on. But all of those are related to cyberspace or contemporary issues, and hopefully there there's some of concern to you that I can that I can discuss now. Just briefly, how many of you had an opportunity to read through the article by by Dr. Deaver? I it just everyone had a chance to do that. Did anyone get to see him speak? He, he spoke at the Clark Forum uh, in the beginning of February on cyberspace. I don't know if any of you were able to make that, make his presentation on there. Good, then you won't judge me because he's much better. At <laughs> <laughs> Since he's the author of the article, uh, Ron Deaver, by the way, Dr. Deaver, has been here several times participating in workshops that have been sponsored uh, uh, by the U.S. Army War College. So he, he and uh, Rafael Ravinsky, who is another one of his um, collaborators on many uh, papers and projects on there, are friends with the War College and have, 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 have uh, represented and, 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 and supported the efforts here for quite some time. Well, these are the areas I'd like to talk about, about equally spaced out. First and foremost is a little bit about the context of cyberspace, what I will mean for the presentation here, what is considered cyberspace. Then, as I mentioned, looking at kind of the dual-edged sword nature of opportunities and threats that are presented to the global community by cyberspace. Look at how currently cyberspace is being governed, both nationally and internationally, and, and then look a little bit to the future on what that is. And I'll try to interweave some of the topics that were in the article. I actually went through and looked at all the major ones and tried to work them in as best as I can. I'll touch on... I'll try to touch on all of them, but I won't be able to go into detail, uh, in great detail on those. So to cover these areas, I need to first set a, a firm foundation of what do I mean by cyberspace. And first, I'll, I'll invoke the old adage of the blind men and the elephant, if you're familiar with that. You had a group of blind men who came upon an elephant, and one of them grabbed the leg, another one grabbed the trunk, one grabbed, you know, they each touched a different part of the elephant. And the one that had the leg said, well, the elephant is a tree because it's big and it's solid and I can barely get my arms around it. 
The other one had the trunk and say, no, 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 it's, it, it's a snake because it's moving and I have it in here. And, and the other one had a, had a hold of its ear and said, no, no, it's a, it's a giant leaf because it, it, it's, you know, it, it's, it's broad and thin and all that. And, of course, they were all right, but they were also all wrong. They all saw part of, si- or part of the elephant, and, and from what they could ascertain from what their senses told them, that's what they said, well, that's what the elephant is. If they all worked together, they might have been able to divine what the elephant was. But the fact of the matter is it didn't change what the elephant was, even though they couldn't see that. Cyberspace, in many ways, is, is that way as well. Depending on how you're going to be entering it and using it, frames how you view its, its usefulness in there. Now, there are a lot of definitions, and I've left the one up there uh, uh, at the bottom that is the current Department of Defense definition, which is very uh, much in line with the one that's also in the National Security Strategy for the United States. And I'll go ahead and read that. Uh, it says it's a global domain within the information environment consisting of the interdependent network of information technology infrastructures, including the Internet, telecommunications network, computer systems, and embedded processors and controllers, and I always add in to that definition and their operators because that makes it consistent with the national security space. Well, no matter what definition you look at, and trust me, there are many. In fact, there are some articles that are dedicated to just talking about the different de- cyberspace. Most of them settle on three primary dimensions, and those are the cognitive part, the human brain, how you're going to be arriving at thoughts and, and that will be communicated or will be perceived. The other is the content. And by the content, I mean that's the actual data that you're, that you're transferring back and forth, usually in digital form, usually photographs or music or emails that have all been converted to ones and zeros sent along an electronic path and reassembled, or the software that it takes to do those functions. And then there is the uh, connectivity part, which is the hardware. And the connectivity can be a laptop, it can be a smartphone, it can be part of the fiber optic, the copper wires that are running along to make all of that work together. But those three dimensions, the cognitive, the content, and the connectivity, more or less form what, what is known in cyber, as cyberspace. Now, these overlap. It's not equal parts, and they're not always the same one. In fact, if you can think of them as kind of ebbing and flowing sometimes, almost like a tide along the ocean. And by the way, did anyone was, uh, who was here for last week, or actually they had for, for Dr. Butt's uh, a presentation on the oceans? Good, good, because I'm going to be talking a little bit about what he mentioned, the commons. The ocean is a comment. I'll talk a little bit about cyberspace uh, in that context as, as well. So you have these dimensions. They're overlapping. They're changing. The interfaces are different, different applications. And right now, I think it's safe to say most of the attention that's being paid on cyberspace comes down to that uh, element built with information technology, commerce, technology, what you see being sold to you is usually dealing with computers and smartphones are plans of, of how to connect those together. But if we were to draw back further, um, we would look at it maybe as saying, well, as you have these individual systems that are working with each other, uh, cyberspace is not really formed until they all work together in a common area, almost as if it, analogous to the commons that, that Dr. Butts was talking about that the oceans represent. And in fact, um, Admiral Sabra, looking at, as I mentioned, uh, uh, the, the three elements of cyberspace, and I mentioned uh, Dr. Dr. Butt's lecture and when he was talking about the oceans being a, a global common, something that is there for commerce and trade for, for everyone uh, in, in the, uh, on the planet. And uh, Admiral Sabrowski, who was uh, Secretary Rumsfeld's uh, kind of point man for transformation back in the early 2000s, uh, also shared that view, and when he was looking at cyberspace, he gave it the, the other definition that's up there and saying it is uh, can be considered a new strategic common analogous to the sea uh, as an international domain of trade and communication. And if you really look at what is what cyberspace is being used for, it, it certainly can fit that model. So which is better to look at, space is a, or cyberspace as a domain or cyberspace as a commons? It depends on the application that you're going to be using it for. And 
Here, what I've put up is an example of a graphic that is being looked at in some areas of what joint doctor might say and say that cyberspace is a domain that can blend in with air and space and the land and the sea. And if you're looking to organize, train, and equip a force to, to carry out national security efforts under Title 10 of U.S. Code, that's appropriate. And in fact, we now have a strategy that comes out and, and talks about that. But if you're looking in the bigger picture of what cyberspace is and what it means to the global area and other elements of national power, it is better viewed as a commons. To me, the best way overall is even if you're looking at it for the domain aspect, you need to consider that bigger context to really understand all the intricacies that go along with that. And even if you look within the, the commons we have now, this is a kind of a pie chart on the distribution of, um, of population of the, inter, of the internet right now, and I'll show how that's grown uh, in just a moment. But that blue, that blue slice right there is North America, and it's reading at what? About 13, a little over 13% of the global population. So that's kind of, if you look in the commons area, the big red slice is, is, is the uh, Asian uh, markets in, that are in there. And in fact, if we look to see how cyberspace has grown uh, from kind of zero point roughly in December 1995, that's the, the chart I'm using here, to over 2 billion in less than 25 years. And it's, if you, that's, that's just looking at the number of users, uh, and that's just looking at the internet, and that's not all of cyberspace. Of course, if you were to look at the number of devices, there's, it's getting close to where there's almost one device for every person on the planet. Because as, as you've probably noticed, uh, especially if you're like my son or my daughter, um, they have more than one device that can, that can connect to the internet. They have their, use their, their laptop, which they use for their schoolwork, and they have a smartphone, and they may have other things, uh, like uh, my wife has a Kindle Fire. I have a Nook that I use. All these things that have the ability to, to in, interconnect uh, into the internet there. And if you look at how it's broken down uh, by, by countries, it's here, again, the top one, not surprising, is China, with over 420 million users as of June of last year. Um, and the, the United States is second with about 240. So together, they have, uh, we in China have a third of the, of the users of the internet uh, in our countries. Just in about 2009, the number of users in the United States and China was roughly equal. And now they've just about got to the point where they're, where they're double that number. Uh, the other countries, just for your interest in the top 10 there, uh, some may surprise you, some maybe not. Uh, Japan has about 100 million, and then India, uh, Brazil, Germany, Russia, UK, France, and then number 10 is uh, Nigeria. And uh, so you can see there, the, the, there, it's not, those are, that hits just about every continent and all numbers that, uh, see the, the smallest among those is Nigeria with 44 million and that's only 1 million less than France. Now how are those, how are those, uh, those internet users distributed? Well I can't show you a chart that exactly shows all the location, but let me give you an idea. This chart you may have seen before, it's a picture that NASA put together. It's a composite picture from different satellite images and images from, the, from space uh, looking at the Earth at night. And what do you see is what, where the population centers are uh, throughout the world. Well, what's interesting, and this is a graphic that Facebook put together, and they looked and said, well, of all the, of, of the individuals who have Internet accounts and, and who interact on, on Facebook, Here's kind of some of the connectivity among them, and it has a lot of commonality. It also has, if you note, a big dark region in there. And what, it, what country is that? That's, that's China. We'll talk a little bit why that's dark. It doesn't mean that they don't participate in social media, but it does mean that their government has certain controls over their access to the internet, which is certainly an issue that, that Ron had talked about in his article. And again, these are just some of the statistics I mentioned before. Again, right now with about uh, 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 2 billion users overall, the United States and, and China being one third of the users out there. Another area I'll mention 
I get my laser pointer to working here, this, this term SCADA, which you may have heard of, uh, supervisory control and data acquisition, that's a fancy term for, for, for types of computer systems that operate industrial equipment. What I mean by industrial equipment, I mean equipment such as power generating facilities, water treatment facilities, and others that like that that, that, that are, are using uh, computer processors to gain efficiency and to take, take uh, down the amount of human interaction that's required. Um, but it's also areas of potential avenues of attack. And again, I'll, I'll mention a little bit about that later on. Uh, the final thing I want to show you, just to convince you, if I haven't yet, uh, about the, the nature of cyberspace as a commons, this is static. I want to show you a graphic uh, real quickly here, and it'll be running in the background behind me, which is a little bit more dynamic. Uh, there's an organization, the Cooperative Association for Internet Data Analysis in San Diego, which has done some very interesting uh, mapping of the Internet uh, and the traffic across the Internet. Uh, the graphic I'm about to show you is partially funded by the Department of Homeland Security and the National Science Foundation. And what they did is they took a specific uh, virus that was, that was propagated by email and looked to see uh, how it propagated throughout the world. And what's interesting is what you're going to see is a 16-day snapshot. And you'll see the Earth's shadow it's, it, uh, as it would, uh, the, the, the Earth's shadow basically as it passes through. So you'll see day and night coming on, on the Earth as it. Just notice how the, how the, um, the incidence of the email spread, uh, the, of the virus spreading coincide with the time of day and the location on different population centers. And by the way, this, there's two graphics here. The, the upper one will be a, uh, a circle, the lower one will be a bar. And the larger the circle or the higher the bar, the more infections were, were noted on that site. So it's, ah, technology is cooperating. So that, that shadow you see going across there, when it's light, that means it's day. When it's not, it's, it's the evening. And if you remember that map that we just saw, both of the Earth at night, the Facebook items, and then the, there are similar population centers here again that are showing uh, the virus as it's being, being spread. Now, as this continues, the point I'm making here is that there's something more to cyber. This, this would get more into that cognitive element of cyberspace, away from just the pure code and the pure um, connectivity. And in other words, the social nature, the way the users interact as they would in any other society, also impact the way information is spread in cyberspace. And what was interesting, you might say, well, how could you figure, how could you address, how did, how did they determine this data? What was interesting about this one virus and the reason that the center uh, uh, picked it is because it was one of the things the virus did is when it infected the, when it successfully infected a computer, one of the first things it did is send a verification notice to a website. And they basically went to that website and looked at all the, the logins from that and counted how many times it had been infected in a given time. So these are some of the dynamics. Uh, when I mention cyberspace, when I'm thinking about that from, from this point forward, it's a global view. It's not just looking at the technology. It's not just looking at defense elements. It's not just looking at uh, information or the individual. It's all these areas across all elements of national power. And of course, that's going to present opportunities and threats. And again, I like to pick these as as that kind of dual-edged sword, because sometimes the same thing that provides that opportunity is the exact same thing that also provides the threat in here. It's not unique to cyberspace, but again, I'll, I'll try to talk or walk you through some of the areas uh, to, to illustrate that. Now, I apologize. This next slide is, is a bit of an eye chart. I don't expect you all to see all the areas on there, so I'm going to walk you through, because I really just want to show some trends. As I mentioned before, going from a population of zero to over two billion in 25 years in, in cyberspace, just from internet uh, users, is, is very impressive. But what were some of the activities that facilitated that extraordinary growth? And what are the opportunities and where, is, where are those growth trends going? Well, one of the ones you may have heard of is represented by this little graphic down here. And it's all you need to recognize is that there's an exponential curve going here, and it represents 
uh, what's known as Moore's Law, which is the, the, uh, the doubling of, of, of computational capability about every 18 months. And what you've seen there are some of the processors. Um, I was uh, over at the gym this morning having a little MP3 player, which I think I bought for $14. And the computational capability in that player was greater than what uh, President Reagan was trying to put out at Falcon Air Force Base back in the 80s as part of the Star Wars. That's pretty amazing. In fact, I've been out to the facility there, and they actually designed the stairwell around the area where they were going to put the computer, because it was going to have to be immersed in, in liquid to, to keep it from bubbling up. And it was going to go at a blinding you know, 1 billion operations per second. Well, now, you know, if I told that to my son, he's like, well, that's really going to slow me down, Dad. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's going to not work right. And the thing is, not only can you get it readily available, and it, I mean, you don't even have to, if, 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 you are, if you have a military ID, you can walk across the street there to the, to the PX and purchase items that, can, that have capability in every area that is superior to what used to be cutting-edge technology for military defense. So that's one of the areas that, that's caused that growth. Another is when you look at the memory, uh, uh, how much it costs to save data uh, in there. This chart shows a, kind of the bathtub of two, two, two curves. One is showing the amount of uh, data that would be stored on a typical um, uh, hard drive. I'm sorry, that's, that's the one going up. And the other is the cost for that data. So back oh, a little over 20 years ago, it would cost you over $500 to have a gigabyte of, of information on a, on a hard drive. Well, now if you go to buy, uh, most you, you probably, it's getting more difficult to buy hard drives that are measured in gigabytes anymore. They've gone up to, to terabytes. And you're looking at now gigabytes going from about $500 each to now about five cents. So $500 to a nickel in about 20 or 30 years. And what that means, what does that give you the capability? The, the, the hard drives now going from that maybe one gigabyte up to three, four terabytes. When you're talking terabytes, you're talking somewhere in the neighborhood about 10 terabytes contains the entire Library of Congress. So now you can start going out to your, you, know, you might have to go to Staples or, or Office Max or something to get some of those drives, but it's not a special order item to get, to get hard drives in there. Now, of course, getting those populated with the information is an entirely different story, but the capability there is, is available, readily available, and it's inexpensive. And going to my other trend chart here, the, all these upswings are just showing uh, a commerce that is being, that is being uh, used over mobile devices, uh, electronic commerce, e-commerce. Just looking at mobile devices here, and the trends here should not surprise you. They're from companies such as eBay, PayPal, Target, and Amazon.com. But again, the opportunity for investors to, to, put in, uh, to put their capital up and hopefully get a good return on that is there. The final trend I'd like to show that offer opportunities for the global community is a way we connect with each other. And if you've been, there's, there's many different uh, types of social websites or just email or smartphones. And what this chart here is showing is that as you, as you have more and more people uh, that, that have that access, they can make more and more connections together. And, it's, and that's uh, Metcalfe's law. It's, uh, uh, shows basically the number of nodes that if you, know, if, if you know a person and then they know another person and they introduce you and you start doing that by two or three or four, it grows exponentially. What's the interesting part is this other curve that's coming up here is what's called Dunbar's number. And what it, it says, and it's more based on sociology and psycho psychology and, and neuro neurology, it's saying, you know, the human brain can only keep track of so many things at a given time. So even though you may have the capability to, the, the, the technology may offer you the ability to have a Facebook with a thousand friends on it, you probably can only keep regular contact and actually organize that using your brain at, at a limited number. And that yellow number in between is saying, well, there's an opportunity for certain types of filtering software to help you maybe keep track of that and filter out emails or social contacts or et cetera, help you with calendar functions uh, on that. Overlaid of those trends, and again, the computational capability, the ability to store information, the ability to make money, 
and the ability to make contacts with people, you start seeing that the web, as you were, the internet, uh, starts changing a little bit. And it goes from this first part of just saying we're going to connect information together. We're just going to send emails. We're just going to send ones and zeros or maybe a picture here and there to being able to be kind of a social web, connecting people. And when you start getting the ability to pass information and connect people, you start connecting knowledge. Because now you add, uh, if you have the information there and you add the, the context of, of individuals who can access that, you start giving meaning to that information. It's not just data, it's not just numbers of it actually requires knowledge. When you start bringing all those together and start sorting some of that through, you have the opportunity to actually have a ubiquitous web, what they'd say, where you actually are starting to connect intelligence. Now, intelligence is a term when you're talking cyber space. I'm not talking about Terminator and things coming back from the future. Not, not into the science fiction realm, so, and I'm probably not going to talk too much about artificial intelligence, but there's, well, maybe one slide towards the end. We'll see. How many of you are Jeopardy fans? So you know who Watson is. I'll talk a little bit about uh, Watson and, and some of the areas there. But the, the, the issue is, is that there is this opportunity for all of this information up there to augment and, and, and expand uh, man's knowledge and hopefully to bring it to bear to certain activities such as uh, trying to cure cancer, trying to look at ways of, of looking at limited resources on the planet on how best to be uh, stewards of that. Of course, uh, the other side of that is all of these areas that I've mentioned here that can be used for good can also be used by those who, who would, would, would have more self, selfish motives or nefarious motives as threats. And rather than step through, this, this chart's a little bit easier to understand. Uh, this is just looking at some of the, uh, the ways that threats have gone into, uh, have been noticed in, in, in cyberspace over the years, and they're becoming more and more sophisticated. Uh, it used to be just guys would go in and say, ah, I'm going to go into a site and try to guess what the password is, maybe just doing it by, by random uh, numbers on there. Um, started getting into breaking, finding ways of breaking into banks, accounting systems, and maybe doing some items. Uh, different, different ways of doing this. You've seen now maybe terms like spear phishing and spoofing and some of the emails that have gone out there, heard of of uh, things like Trojan horses and viruses and worms that can be passed with your, uh, through your uh, emails or just sometimes uh, through connections to the internet. People that are out there trying to compromise your, your, your computer. What's interesting is the methods, if you're looking from a purely technical sense, they're getting very sophisticated by design, uh, similar in a way that your, that MP3 player I was talking about or your Nook or something is very sophisticated compared to uh, that, that Star Wars system that we were planning back in the 80s. But while they're becoming more technologically sophisticated, the knowledge to use them is not. And in fact, I, I borrowed this from another briefer. It, it kind of said the, it, it's almost, uh, he used a, a, a firearms example, saying back if you looked in the early days of firearms and at what, what a musketeer really was, someone who had a, a musket that was probably built by a gunsmith uh, was not one that was produced in mass quantity, not very accurate, not very reliable, took a lot of skill just to be able to load it and fire it and get it to the target. And if it broke, it was usually the person who owned it or someone he knew who would have to go in and repair it. To right now, cyber uh, threats and, and the malware that is out there is almost like an AK-47. And you can turn on the news at just about any time during the day and say some part of crisis in the world where that's kind of the weapon of choice. Why? It's cheap, it's simple to use, you can slam it in, put it out there, and, and, and you don't have to be, have sophisticated weapons training to be able to cause damage. Um, along with that analogy, at the same time, it can cause a lot of damage that the user doesn't intend. So I'm not advocating that it's a good thing at all. Uh, what, it, what, I'm at, what I'm pointing out is that the threat is now not only more sophisticated, but it's easier to get in, into the hands of uh, into the hands of uh, people that want to do uh, uh, bad things. So that's a general background of the the opportunities and the threats. What I'd like to do real quickly now, and this is some from uh, Dr. Debert's article and some others that you may have read about. Just mention in, uh, some of the examples of of these these opportunities and threats. 
and I'll give them in the areas, the traditional areas of national power, which is, you can see there, diplomatic, informational, military, and economic. So an opportunity, you've, these are ones you're probably familiar with. For example, in the, in the area of diplomacy, we've seen in the areas of uh, uh, Egypt, Tunisia, others, the opportunity for uh, what's known as the Arab Spring, where social media has helped uh, individual populations to perhaps come to more democratic reforms, to change their, their way that they're being governed in a positive way. We've also seen where some people have gone, been able to go out and facilitate it by organizations like WikiLeaks to take national security issues and, and, and put them out for everyone to see on the, on the web. Information, again, we talk about uh, Facebook and other, uh, other uh, forms of uh, social media that have allowed people to connect that have maybe never connected before to allow different communities to come together to help issues, uh, maybe it's uh, support groups for, again, people that are, that are facing illnesses or that are uh, spouses uh, with, their, with, their, uh, with their, um, uh, their other spouse that's deployed worldwide, being able to help each other and out while they're gone. And uh, the, the bad side of information may be something like we're experiencing in China and that, that kind of black hole you saw on the uh, Facebook graphic where you have more authoritative control by some countries over how the information is, is, passed, or is allowed to be passed back and forth among the populace and how much intrusion governments are allowed to look into people's individual private communications. From the military aspect, we can see some opportunities that are offered by uh, the opportunity for collective defense by sharing what uh, knowledge about threats in there and helping each other out in terms of that. I'll give an example a little bit later about uh, uh, some cyber activities that went on in 2007 in the country of Estonia, which has driven a lot in uh, uh, the uh, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO's uh, attack, or, I'm sorry, their, their, their policy on how they're looking at how they would respond to cyber attacks, how they would re respond to cyber incidents, and uh, how that's been evolving. Of course, on the military, too, some have talked about different new battlegrounds uh, uh, being, being initiated, the potential for cyberspace to, to elevate to the point of almost war by attacking different infrastructure or military command and control systems, or as I mentioned before, some of the, uh, the uh, SCADA systems, uh, the, the, the ones that run industrial systems that may provide our day-to-day -day necessities for life. And finally, in the area of economy, but think back to the, the, the graph about the e-commerce and how, that's, uh, how that has progressed. Information technology itself, it's, it's not a self-looking ice cream cone, but it is certainly uh, has offered, a, in, in itself has become a, a large part of the, the economy now. Uh, entertainment, music, uh, telecommunications, it is now a significant part in that economy. And Whenever there's, a, there's money that's being made by legitimate and ethical means, there are those who would like to do it by unethical or illegal means in the cyber crime. And the opportunity for cyber criminals to go out and use other people's computers to carry out crimes is, uh, is well documented. Uh, the good, it, it, and, and sadly, the cyber crime is increasing. Uh, um, but the Department of Justice uh, uh, Interpol, other organizations are developing ways of uh, dealing with this. There have been many cases where there have been individuals in other countries that have stolen money, stolen intellectual property in the United States, and have been brought to justice, been extradited back into the United States, back to the United States, and held accountable for their actions. So again, that's an evolving system in there. But given this broad spectrum of all these areas that, that need to be dealt with, what does the international community look like? How is the internet, how is cyberspace being governed now? Well, I gave a lecture back in November on the similar topics about uh, looking at in transnational issues, and I came upon inspiration by an American painter, uh, Cassius uh, Marcellus Coolidge. And I'm not sure if, you're, if, you, if any of you are familiar with Mr. Coolidge. Um, he's, he's famous for the um, dogs playing poker. Um, 
ones on there. And, and, and it kind of inspired me, and especially this is his friend in need, which he, the, 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 the shtick here is the one little bulldog passing an ace to the other one on there. So why would this inspire me, besides being a little bit of a, a little bit of levity, why would this inspire me to think about cyberspace, uh, uh, cyberspace governance? Well, by no means, I don't mean to, to make light of, there's a lot of great efforts, and I will show you the great of serious efforts, a lot of individuals that are trying to do this, but it is like uh, the, the current situation, is it's still evolving like dogs playing poker. Not every dog at that table has the same interest in that poker game, and you're not even really sure if they're playing by the same normal you know, rules of the game uh, because they're dogs, and it's, it's poker. So it's, it's a little bit of ridiculous in there. What it is, we have a lot of different cultures, a lot of different uh, national sovereign issues that are coming together that we don't always agree on. That's okay. That's what the international community is. So it's not surprising that there's going to be uh, some, some, some friction and some ways of having to work together to, to attack this, this uh, issue. The starting point, now how do we move away from this dogs playing poker to where we can actually get, get some, uh, some rules and some international norms on there? Well, in, in uh, 2009, uh, right at the beginning of the, uh, the Obama administration, uh, there was commissioned a cyberspace policy review and it was a 90-day commission, and its reports were published in May of 2009. It was a good starting point. It built off a lot of the cyber security information that had been done by the Bush administration, and it came up with five areas of emphasis to start uh, to, to kind of set the course for the nation. And those were developing a comprehensive strategy, developing unified responses to cyberspace incidents, looking at what the private and public type of uh, in interfaces should be along with the government, investing in research and development, and making sure uh, that the, the public has cybersecurity awareness. Over the last two years, this policy has been fleshed out to a great degree, and in fact, 2011 was a, was a great uh, year for, for actually having further, uh, uh, further uh, policies and strategies issued by, by the administration. And the way, getting back to the poker game, we've kind of dealt ourselves a hand now. And what I would say in there, and of course, these form the, uh, the dime, I, I, it, it, the, the, uh, 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 a strategy in each of the areas of our national elements of national power. So we have an international strategy for operating in cyberspace for the diplomatic. We have a national strategy for trusted identities in cyberspace, the NSTIC, which talks about information issues. We have a DOD strategy for operating in cyberspace for the military issues. And we have a cyberspace innovation and internet economy green paper. It's a work in progress. That's the one that's the furthest lagging behind, but it, Department of Commerce has probably some of those daunting issues in there. All those were issued between about May and July of last year. And at the same time, the, the kicker on there, the kicker card, I put an ace for, for, for allied, was uh, the NATO uh, cyber defense policy that came out in June of 2011 uh, following the NATO uh, Lisbon summit uh, the previous November, which revalidated a lot of the security issues that, 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 were, that had been kind of considered Cold War issues uh, with NATO, making sure they were still relevant, they were still contemporary, and that they were incorporating these new issues. But the question is, if you're a poker player, are we dealing, are we dealing with a, you know, a royal flush, or could this potentially be a dead man's hand, the old aces and eights? Well, we want it to be the winning hand in there. So what, what, is, what needs to take place uh, for these areas to do? I'm not going to walk through each of these strategies because we just don't have the time. So if you want to address any aspects in there, I, I'd ask you to, to, to save that for the Q&A. But I will touch briefly on the international strategy for cyberspace. I think this is a very good document and it sets a very good tone. First of all, what it is, it is an international strategy that's been, that's been published and made public for everyone on the planet to read. It stays consistent with the, the themes from the State Department of having diplomacy, defense, and development of the third world and other countries to help them along um, uh, in, in, this, in, this, uh, in this issue, in this, in this um, commons, 
and it sets seven policy priorities. And I'm going to read those because I, I may not be able to see them from where you are, but they're ones we've discussed. Economy, protecting our networks, law enforcement, military, internet governance, international development, and internet freedom. Now certainly all of those are going to require a lot of effort and, uh, and, and require cooperation uh, of all nations to ha have those occur proper, or for those to be successful. And in fact, when we're talking about looking at national and international infrastructures, we have to look and say that the way cyberspace is designed and distributed, and about 90% of the infrastructure is owned by private industry. If there is not cooperation, and if there's not cooperation among industry and not cooperation among nations, then the greater whole of cyberspace cannot exist because there'd be no way of you sending information to other countries if they won't agree to accept that information. Now, a lot of the protocols on the, the, the technology and the mechanics are worked out in their existing for for that. But again, this, this uh, looking at developing existing laws, looking at how these, 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 are, these are balanced, especially with, with the, the sometimes uh, uh, competing terms of, of having security and ensuring privacy are ones that are, that are left to many different international fora. And again, I, I'll show you one more, kind of an eye chart, and it's meant to be an eye chart because it's, these are, 26 or 24 different international fora that exist out there, some of them under the UN, some under European community, some under other areas uh, uh, that are existing. And these are all the federal departments or agencies that interface with them. And this line right across here uh, is the Department of State. And they have interface with, uh, I think, about 15 of those uh, 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 fora on there and have a, 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 a sometimes leadership role and some other just, just supporting. But these are important for them. And so just, these are just some of the really big ones that, are, that exist out there. Imagine getting all these to work together to form out how the governance is, is working in cyberspace, and you get an idea of the complexity of the issues there. And by the way, I rarely would get up and say, recommend that you read a, a, a GAO report. <laughs> but this is actually a GAO report. It was one, uh, I can give you the reference if you're interested afterwards in there. It actually steps through very briefly and describes each of these four, uh, what they are, what they do, and who the members are. Very good reference document, um, compliments of your, of your taxpayer's money on there. But again, this is how uh, the internet governments, governance is done at the international area just by these four on here. Um, within the United States, of course, we also take a whole of government approach in there, but it's uh, largely defined by United States Code and different titles under there. And what I've done here is show that if we're looking at developing cybersecurity, it starts with the President of the United States giving direction. He has a cyberspace coordinator there now. His name is Howard Schmidt. He was designated uh, for that position in, in December of 2009. Uh, it's one of the actions that came out of that cyberspace policy review. And they're trying to coordinate some of the areas you may be familiar with, the Department of Defense, Title 10, uh, some of the areas in the National Intelligence dealing Title 50, the National Security Agency. All these have to work together, all, all required to have obligations and, and roles that are defined by law that are established by Congress. So again, this is not something that's going out there doing crazy things on there. It is methodical and it is and it is governed and it's evolving as to what the responsibility should be. And again, I'll get back to some of those uh, paper articles you read in the paper about different legislation going out, um, looking at how you need to balance that security and privacy within the internet. Well, despite the best efforts we can have internationally and nationally, there's still going to be the potential for conflict in cyberspace. This slide doesn't give you any any solutions? It just asks some of the questions that you're that are that are going to be that, that need to be addressed in the future. When does competition in cyberspace cross the line into aggression? It's a global market out there. We are competing for for, for getting a market edge among among companies in the United States, but also among countries. And sometimes with globalization, those may be two of the same things. But if one company 
breaks into another company's computer and steals its intellectual property right, is that going beyond competition? Well, certainly the European Union and, and the, so some of the, the, the agreements that people have signed off on, a, on the cybercrime initiative in there would say, yes, it does. And there are some items in there. But what else? When does that now cross the line into aggression and into conflict? How should we respond uh, to incidents of aggression in cyberspace? Uh, well, we've got some guidelines on that. I'll get to that in just one more minute. And uh, who defines the threshold about when we do do a response? How can you keep the activities of cyberspace that we're doing so that they're not being aggressive or, or, or infringing upon the rights of other nations? And uh, when does that aggression, again, move into even, be, even above conflict and actual armed conflict and start looking into potential warfare? I don't have time. I can come back to this slide during the Q&A. Uh, but if you have a, the, the two case studies that are probably the most familiar that are out there uh, are Estonia in 2007 and Georgia in 2009. I don't have, I'm sorry, 2008. Rather than going through the details, in a nutshell, the attacks on, uh, on Estonia, which have never been fully attributed to anyone, but is largely thought to have been uh, from Russia, were purely looking on the, at, at, at cyber attacks, probably due to the fact that they moved a, a World War II a Russian memorial out of a prominent position in there. Estonia was, is a very highly connected uh, a country, and it really kind of brought their economy and their government to the knees for, for a little bit of time. In Georgia, there were cyber attacks that coincided with ground force attacks coming into to Georgia on there. And again, I, I don't have time to go through the details uh, of all that. What I'd like to do instead, um, maybe come back to this during Q&A if you'd like, is to talk about how we as the United States has stated we will start considering responses and again take you back to the international strategy for, for cyberspace because one of the things that it incorporated in there I think is a very laudable um, segment in there where it talks about its interest, uh, the United States interest in cyberspace and how it will view potential acts of aggression and again bear with me I want to turn a little bit here and read these so I can make sure they, they get out for both, both y'all in the YouTube uh, audience as well. But this is, these are direct quotes from the document. The right of self-defense, consistent with the United Nations Charter, it states that we have an inherent right to self-defense that may be triggered by certain aggressive acts in cyberspace. And that when warranted, the United States will respond to hostile acts in cyberspace as we would to any other threat to our country. And we reserve the right to use all necessary means diplomatic, informational, military, and economic, as appropriate and consistent with applicable international law in order to defend our nation, our allies, our partners, and our interests. In doing so, we will exhaust all options before military force whenever we can. So as any good deterrent statement is, it gives some specifics but it, by, by, def, by, by design, it also has some vagueness and some ambiguity to allow flexibility of action in there. We don't want to go to a country and say, if you do this, that's it. We're drawing the line here because their response is, well, if that's the line, I guess I can operate right up to it, right? We're never probably going to come up with a definition of aggression. We haven't really done that in, in uh, the area of physical conflict, and that's why in the United, St or the United Nations we have the uh, articles uh, you know, 41 and 42 that go to the National Security Council and have ways of getting national secure, or, or, I'm sorry, you, uh, United Nations Security Council resolutions to bring together nations to address issues like this. Of course, when we're doing in cyberspace, the UN will certainly be a venue that's in there, but looking at the reality of politics in international affairs, we have to realize that in addition to us in France and the United Kingdom being on the permanent members of the, of the UN um, uh, Security Council, there's China and Russia, which are probably some of our competitors in a lot of areas, including uh, commerce and in and, and, and cyberspace as well. Uh, competitors, not necessarily aggressors or anything like that, but we, we've seen in the past where that may, may go uh, further. So this is the current statement 
of the United States and how it would deal with issues in there. I can't overemphasize again, it, it also talks about saying we're going to try to look at this by all areas of national power, not just do, doing a knee-jerk reaction and saying send the military in. And in fact, in some cases, that may not be appropriate, especially when we're dealing with the area of, of cybercrime. There are areas of doing that. That really falls in the Department of Justice as it should, and the state can help coordinate that among nations. Well, for the last uh, minute or so here, I want to talk a little bit about the future. I told you I'd have Watson back up here again. For, for those of you who aren't Jeopardy fans, what you're looking at there is, the, uh, is Alex Trebek with the two winningest uh, um, Jeopardy champions, the, the all-time winner in the number of games and the all-time winner as far as money goes. And they were pitted against Watson, which is a creation of uh, IBM. And this is kind of like you know John Henry going up against the uh, you know the steam engine, right? And who won that one? Uh, it wasn't John Henry. That's how I got the song written. <laughs> and just like here, uh, Watson uh, won won the day uh, very convincingly. Now, does that mean that we now have artificial intelligence that, that, going, that can go out there and take over the thing? No, you saw during the, the shows actually some some interesting areas where. Watson made mistakes a human never could do, but Watson also um, had access to information and the ability to access it so rapidly more than any human could as well. And what's really interesting is when you hear people talk about Watson, and especially the IBMers, just like I've been doing here, I'm guilty of it as well, you start talking about it, it's almost it's a person. It almost takes on a persona with that. But it is a machine, a very expensive and highly technical machine, and it took I don't know how many thousands and thousands of, of, of uh, hours of programming and information in there. But it shows a little bit of glimpse into the future because what is available there in Watson now took all that, that capability. But just as I mentioned to you before, if you look at how, how things have evolved in cyberspace, going back again to the 1980s, the Reagan administration, the Strategic Defense Initiative and some of the battle management they were looking at there and looking to get these Cray computers that would need an entire stairwell and liquid cooling to operate that now I can strap onto my arm and, and run along and have two gigabytes of, uh, of uh, music on there. Uh, and all that taking place in a little over you know, three decades. You've got to think, what's gonna, what is Watson going to look like? How is that going to be available? And when that kind of information gets out there, we're looking at an organization of cyberspace that may change as well. Connections may be different in there. One of the areas I, I've been trying to focus on the work I've been doing and looking for others who are, and there's not a lot out there, is actually looking into the ontology of cyberspace. In other words, trying to look at what it actually is and how it's evolving, how the interconnections are, who's making them, and, and how they're changing. And part of it is it's an evolving system, as you can see, just in its sheer size, uh, it, it, it has evolved in the number of users, but it's also being created uh, uh, and expanding daily. Every time there's a new device developed, there's a little bit more cyberspace added. Every time you send an email or, or a text or call someone or send a, a picture of your, your family or, or, or an outing or something, you're adding to that entire cyberspace effort. There's no real telling right now. There, there's different postulations, and in fact, we had a conference here back in December looking at several different future scenarios of how the, those realms are the, are the dimensions of the cognitive, the connectivity, and the, connect, and the content are going to change and merge. But I would throw out again, this is, this is pure conjecture. I would say that the, the realm of information technology and the ones dealing with the actual mechanical aspects are probably at their, their, their zenith right now. And I think it's going to be moving more towards how we're going to have a, a human interface, how man and machine are going to combine. We're very close. In fact, in some ways, we're already to the point where we're having machines that will come down and actually be implanted. Now, I'm not going to get way off into the science fiction realm. And there's plenty of others on there. Ray Kurzweil is an author, if you're interested in that, that I would recommend you look into some of the areas on that. I don't buy into any of the ones on there. But to me, it's inevitable. We've gotten devices that's smaller and smaller. They want to be accessible. And as I mentioned, I would get back to the one here now. Hopefully, this makes sense a little bit more about the, re the remote-controlled chip implants delivering your, your bone medication, um, looking at things that will be implanted to you to, for monitoring the health of your body, uh, having other areas that will, will be able to enhance the, the, 
the uh, input and output of the information. I'm not saying that's necessarily a good thing. It represents threats and opportunities, and the only way we're going to take advantage of the opportunities and mitigate the threats is to fully understand what we're dealing with. And therefore, I'll, I'll leave with, with a few questions that, that I think a senior leader should be looking at at all levels and in all areas of that, not just in national security, but in the areas of diplomacy, information, economics, et cetera. How is cyberspace evolving? How is it organizing? Is it is its future manifestations going to be more self-organizing and self-regulating to where it almost becomes a true commons, almost like a force of nature? Right now, you know, people joke about saying, you know, where's the off switch for the internet? Well, we found there's really not one on there. There's no one area to cut that off because it is so distributed already. And what I would recommend and again, I have other briefings I can talk to you at great length on <laughs> about. I think it would be, it would be very uh, prudent of us for, as a nation to adopt a policy where, in addition to looking at the here and now threats in cyberspace that we're doing and the opportunities, also have a separate, separately funded, separately dedicated infor, uh, 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 effort that is just looking at examining the, the long-term impacts of cyberspace and trying to fundamentally understand what's going on with that. What that would require is not just computer people and not just telecommunications people, but again, when I was talking about sociologists, psychologists, neurobiologists, people that understand the, the cognitive development as well as the connectivity and, and, and the, the content area. So hopefully, uh, and, and I went a little bit over, but I apologize for the, 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 the mic issues earlier. Hopefully at this point I've, I've convinced you that cyberspace and cybersecurity is much more than just a domain for military operations. And in fact, it covers, it is like a, a, a best, best considered as to be a, a commons uh, that, that offers opportunities and threats for, for commerce, for communications, for interactions in the, in the international community. And that securing this cyberspace commons is going to require a commitment and the cooperation against all elements of, of national power, as well as cooperation and, and integration and commitment from other nations. And that cyberspace is evolving, it's evolving very rapidly, and I would postulate that it may actually evolve to the point where it becomes like a force of nature, where there's really not any controlling it, it's just there, just like the air we breathe, just like the ground we walk on. Cyberspace is out there and we can use it as good stewards, or maybe not if we're not careful and that it may in turn actually influence how we evolve as societies, how we evolve with how we, how we communicate with each other, and how we uh, just govern life, our, our, our due day-to-day -day life here on the, on the planet. Are the Chinese sharing technology So, so the question was, are the Chinese sharing technology with us on the development of cyberspace? Well, you've mentioned, I mean, China, the, China had to come up. China, as you probably noticed in, in the papers, is, is, is probably the best way up to the big boogeyman in cyberspace right now. Um, I don't know as far as sharing technology. I mean, it, it, with a global industry, certainly we are. In fact, um, it, it's a yes and no. We are, it, it, you would say, elements within China, because China is not just the overall country, but there are, there are businesses within China, um, Semant the Semantic Corporation, which uh, many of you may have that as your antivirus, uh, Norton antivirus, et cetera. Part of that's owned by, I think it's Huawei, which is a Chinese company on that. And there's some opportunities and, and risks that go with that. Uh, but I don't think you could, we could have uh, the computers and the technolo technological devices we enjoy right now in the United States without manufacturing from China. Now, the issue comes into is how they've perhaps uh, elements within China have gone in and illegally or pertain that. There's been some uh, quite a bit of um, uh, uh, areas where China has uh, pirated software. That's one of the biggest things where they use illegal versions of the software. Ironically, when they when 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 any anyone illegally uh, steals software, they usually don't get access to the patches that update the vulnerabilities, and they actually become more vulnerable to hackers themselves. So, China is both our competitor 
and, and, our, and, and someone that we cooperate with on various areas in there. Um, I don't think it's in either the U.S. or China's best interest to try to wipe each other out in, in the area of technology. We really are working with each other, but that's going to be a, an issue. It's an issue now, and it's going to continue to be one in there. It's going to take a lot of statecraft, diplomacy, and, and communication between the nations to keep that, that peaceful and cooperative and moving forward. Does that, that answer it more or less? Yeah, thank you. Because of a smart aleck comment I made during Dr. Khan's presentation a week or two ago, people, some think I'm picking on China, but he just said something. I'll just point out, those two mics that wouldn't work are made in China. <laughs> <laughs> You're on. Okay. Uh, Jeff, uh, in our household, uh, I have my 19-year-old uh, grandson who is studying new media design at Harrisburg University. And of course, one of my responsibilities when I worked at the War College was computer security. Uh, and we've been discussing the issue of privacy, the pros and the cons. Now, um, I am on Facebook also, and that the young people almost, I put on Facebook when they go to the bathroom. You know, there's no such thing as private uh, privacy, personal privacy uh, with the young people. They, they text back and forth, you know, all their things. But then we're also seeing bullying and a lot of other things that are happening to young people. Where, where are we headed and what, how does this privacy act that Obama wants to uh, enact uh, going to work. No, it's a, and, and that's, well, that's one of, one of many you know, $64,000 questions that are floating around out there. But just to re, if I can kind of summarize on there, with the issue of privacy in cyberspace, um, how's that being defined and how, what are some of the proposals on how that should be regulated? And the first part you mentioned is very important, and that's that we don't have among individuals an agreement on what privacy is. And uh, during Dr. Debert's uh, uh, brief, at the risk of running into a little bit of non-attribution, but someone, a question had come up uh, about saying, uh, someone in the audience had said, well, hey, I have a Facebook account, and I don't mind. I don't care that anybody can look at it. I don't care if, if anyone in the world can take a look at the things on there. It doesn't bother me a bit. Again, one person's opinion. Is that enough to form a policy? Perhaps not. When you start getting into there, there one of the steps that goes forward in, in privacy is looking at, well, what is private just to you? If you go to a party and you take pictures on there and you put it on your, whatever your social media site of, of choice is, and there's other people in there, do you need to get their permission or should you get their permission to, do, to take that on there? I mean, if you want to share pictures of yourself in less than nice circumstances, that's your decision, but when you start bringing it, where does that privacy come in? And then, if there is a conflict in there, who should come in and adjudicate that? Should it be the government? I mean, ideally, we're in an ideal world, you're going to have people that, that will, you know, will have uh, parents and guardians, et cetera, that will help do that. I think we start bumping up against here, and this is a, a when, I, when I talked about cyberspace ontology and understanding fundamentally what cyberspace is, one of the elements in there, and, and shame on me for not mentioning it, because I think it's one of the most critical issues that, that, that we need to face in the future, is ethics and developing an ethical basis for cyberspace. Because we always know if you, there's a big difference between saying what is legal and what is ethical. And nine times out of 10, if somebody comes up, and I'll, be, I'll show my own bias, especially in the business world, and they ask the question, is this legal? They probably already realize it's unethical. But anyway, <laughs> so the question here is, you know, when you start looking at ethics and, and, and values based in there, and those are being redefined in there. Um, is it up to the government to come in to regulate that? And if it is, do, you, do we actually want individuals to monitor private areas in there? Uh, there was a case in Philadelphia you may have read about within the last year uh, at a high school where they had some uh, laptops that students used. And the administrators, these laptops had cameras on them. And they turned on the cameras while they were in the individual's home without their permission. The reason they gave by at least the newspaper accounts were, well, they were afraid they lost the computers. They wanted to see where they were. But 
you're already starting into this. I mean, they've been chastised. It's going to the courts. It's being adjudicated in there. But again, fundamentally, you're peeking into someone's private domain without their, without their permission. Um, there's no answer. There's no clear answers on this. But certainly, it gets into the area, too, when you start working into what is a, a, a what is now public, is a, I guess, is the flip side of that. What is a public environment? And if you walk in parts of Carlisle, you probably, if you've read in the local paper there again, they put in a lot of new traffic cameras, et cetera, uh, lately. Uh, the, the public domain is being kind of redefined for us. If it's something that's out there and it's public and it's a camera, it can be capturing you. And can that be used just for traffic items? What is the regulations? What are the, 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 the limitations that the government can use to, to do that data? When we're talking to cyberspace, and trust me, when you're at the point where you're going to start losing sleep, because I, I can sleep now, but some of these will start. Now when you start looking at all these different cameras, and you have the ability now, when I talked about the Watson machines, et cetera, like that, to pull all these together, which I think is the issue right now with that, about the Google privacy issues and about some of the things they're looking at there, you now have, an organiz you now have a, a, a company which allows you to sign on and read a, a, an agreement, but they're saying, well, we're going to collect all this data on you, and we're going to combine it with other things to, to basically try to market stuff with you and all that. And we're going to retain some of this data, but it, it's getting to a global scale where they're going to actually be creating uh, knowledge and intelligence that, that you, you, you may not realize uh, um, that, that it, it can be exploited that way. Because again, getting to that kind of the Dunbar curve, our human knowledge can only think about things in, in certain terms. And uh, so that what becomes a public area is, is different. I'll, I'll tell you, quite honestly, the thing, kind of things that scare me, and uh, so I don't, uh, so I don't uh, run into any copyright infringements or whatever, but certain entertainment devices that you can buy for playing games in your home, <laughs> that no, I'll say it's, it's the, the Xbox Connects, because that's in, in there. Um, it's got a camera in that. It mimics your feature. It's a way of wirelessly doing the things on there. But it's a camera that's in your house, it's connected to the internet. And again, this is an axiom that I go by. I look at any, and, I, and, and if you want to read my theory article, I'll give it to you, but I call it reciprocity of connectivity. And it's, it's a fancy word for basically saying, once you go in, once you enter a portal into, the, into cyberspace to access information, when you've opened that door to, to look in, you've also opened that door for anyone else to look at you. So if you've, got a, if you've got a smartphone and you've got a camera on that, I pretty well look at that anyone on the planet that has access to the internet can look at me through that, through that camera. And as with all axioms and theorems, you just have to prove it false to make it, to make it inaccurate. And the, the capability is there. Now, that's not saying that anybody can do it. It takes a lot of technical sophistication and probably the willingness to do illegal you know, to break the law to make that happen. So I'm not saying that's it. And it's sort of like, how do you secure your home? You can, you can walk away, you can put lights on, you can put deadbolts and all that, but if somebody wants to pick up a, you know, a cinder block and throw it through your front window, they're probably going to get in. They're going to make a big mess and they're probably going to get caught. So it's a similar way that way. You, it, it can't be 100% secure. But as you're approaching some of these issues, I think a fundamental thing is we're going to really look at privacy in public in a vastly different way in the next several years as this issue is coming up. So very long-winded answer to that, and, and, uh, but maybe changing the parameters, how, how we think about that. Certainly right now, uh, I don't see the ethics, I don't see people growing to uh, th that, that part of it being in there, jumping right into illegal versus illegal versus what fundamentally is the right thing to do, and what's the right thing to do for the individual, and what's the right thing to do for the community. Uh, in following up on what we've been talking about, I'm wondering to what extent, particularly the military, will be thinking about the possibility of destroying other people, not with tanks and bombs, but by cutting off their water supply or their air supply, or their electricity, or simply starving them to death. How far along that path might we be going, and what are the pros and cons of managing or attacking other, other sovereign countries with a cyber approach? Okay, so 
I think you're, you're, the question is, where are we in the military means of, of, of using cyberspace to, to create physical effects but that actually destroy it? And, and yeah, instead of using tanks and bombs, like I said, using attacks on the uh, power systems, et cetera, to, to, um, uh, to cause loss of life or loss of property. Um, well, that's a great debate, of course, in there. And, and I guess first and foremost is, I think, it, you know, in, in any military professional, the last thing you want to do is go and be, be forced to the point where you have to destroy life or property. You want to, that should be the very last option, whether it's with a tank, whether it's with, with a, a ship or a plane or cyber. That's the option we really don't want to go to. Unfortunately, throughout human history, we found that there's certain cases where you're going to have to, that's, that's a way of doing that. Um, and it would probably be in the military properly in the Title X function of defending the nation that that might happen. Right now, if you look at the, the marching orders that, that have been given in the area of cyberspace, uh, when General Alexander is now the commander of U.S. Cyber Command, it's the first command in there, and the, the, the mission that he has right now is pretty restrictive to protecting the global information grid, the, 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 the dot mil aspect, the command and control system uh, of, the, of the military for it to be able to facilitate other functions and to support other functions. Uh, the capability of, of cutting, out, uh, cutting off power uh, supplies, cutting off power, has been demonstrated. Um, Department of Homeland Security has, has shown some of that in their Idaho National Laboratories. You can actually, there's a public website, you can go and look at some of the things on there and CNN has got some has had some reports a long time for a, a very um, uh, graphic case ratio of a, a turbine being done. As far as the military working to that in plans, sir, I I can't really uh, comment on 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 plans stuff that are that are being done. I, I'm not aware of any personally with that. I've seen no policy stating that that's going in there right now. I think from a pragmatic point, there's still. Uh, just from the efficiency way of doing it with physical force in there. But if there's a way of doing it in, in its plan, I think um, uh, we will, how can I say this, um, in reviewing ways of defending against that, we have to look at ways it could occur. So that's going to be examined in there. Um, but preferably that would not be an aggressive force in, you know, in cyberspace. Some have said whether it be a war in cyberspace, just, you know, computer on computer doing that. I mean, certainly it's feasible. Are they working towards that? Right now, I don't think we fundamentally understand enough about it on how that would, how that would come out. Does that answer most of the, the question in there? Okay. Are, are there um, certain materials, resources needed to build, you, you know, our, the, the network that are available only in certain parts of the world that would make that a security consideration? And also, and I'm thinking, most, I, I think I've heard about that, about the special batteries that all these portable devices use, that some elements of them are, are, are not readily available except in certain places. Yeah, there's, um, I can't talk to all the, you know, to, 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 to the depth of all, or the specifics on the actual materials and that are on that, but I know some reports I could look into on there. but. Certainly, if you look at manufacturing capabilities, there there are certain countries that have uh, that produce batteries, that produce the um, um, the integrated circuits, the memory chips, etc. Uh, that when that produce some for a, a, a large part of the world, and when they have there, there's been historic cases where there's been fires at some factories that you know uh, raise the price of certain elements of computers, etc. Uh, there are some rare earth elements that are only um, some are found in China, some are found in Russia. That that may that may be uh, more scarce in there. Um, but supply chain, I think, is not so, so much from the actual resource in there. Some of the concerns that come in as well as uh, with the supply chain is as you're pulling all these components together, um, is it possible to preload malware in those? In other words, you could buy a brand new computer out of the box and it may be already infected, and that's one of the concerns. And again, this is some of the the areas in there. Supply chain security has been brought up in many different venues uh, in there, and it's, uh, um, again, when it's, that's looked at, if you're looking at a full uh, security package on that. Um, but certainly there are manufacturing centers that, that produce more, more areas than others, and if, if they, are, they are damaged or 
slowed down. It usually means some some things are de de delivered late or at a higher cost. But again, I think um, the Thomas Friedman's book, The Earth is Flat, had talked about it, taking the case of a, a laptop. So I think it was like 200 different manufacturing places all over the world that that contribute to building a typical device like that. So. You mentioned that you think that devices are about at their zenith. Would you be willing to predict a little bit for us of the future? Um, for example, I, this may be a dumb question, but will the whole world be Wi-Fi? Um, and how does that affect usage now that we have to be on a recognized Wi-Fi? And then what about implants? You mentioned them too. Can you just kind of give us a little view here of the future? Yes, let me write one more thing down so I don't forget. Because you brought up a, a good issue, and I'll make sure I want to talk about that. But um, well, I mean, I could I could come up with all kinds of crazy ideas. There's there's lots of interesting ones out there for the future. But uh, if you just take a look at some of the trends we've had in the past and the way things are, and especially with looking at how the generations are are, are going on there, um, uh, certainly Wi-Fi I think is going to be more. Uh, you say is there going to be a global Wi-Fi? Well, sir, there's a gentleman I can't remember his name, but one of the reasons why Estonia is so connected is because of this one gentleman has pushed that uh, uh, very, very aggressively, and he's trying to work with the UN and stuff to make almost like a, a global Wi-Fi, uh, uh, make that almost... Some have argued that that free access to the Internet can almost become another human right, you know, that you, something you couldn't deny someone. Now, I'm not going that far, but I would say that's been, that's been postulated. But what's interesting is what you ask about when, when you said the uh, usage of that. And one of the questions starts to get to is like, well, who has the right to use these things? Just like there's lots of water, and that's, you know, in certain parts of the world, that's, that's a, that is a commodity that's so rare it's worth going to war for. It's a natural resource. So even if you have all this Wi-Fi on there, who gets to control the bandwidth? And uh, there's a, among the other things, along with privacy, there's also some uh, this legislation that's been going about um, and a concept that the uh, Federal Communications uh, um, um, FCC, what's the other C? I'm commission, thank you. <laughs> uh, comes up with called network neutrality. And, that, and it's like right now that the, the kind of tenet is that all things are equal, all data requests are equal, doesn't matter what it is on that. But when you start getting to the point where you even locally have, have more requests than you have bandwidth to be able to accommodate it all, how do you start allocating, prioritizing, is it first come, first serve? Um, and let me share with you one brief vignette uh, that, that occurred when, when um, Steve Jobs, uh, late Steve Jobs, when he introduced, it wasn't, it was one of the, uh, the iPhone 2, I think it was. He was in a big area and it had the usual Apple kind of roll out, very, very high tech, and he's out in the jeans and a t-shirt. It's normal, the, the typical Steve Jobs, and he's got thing out there and people are going nuts in the audience. But if you look at the audience, just about everybody has a laptop and they're all, and a lot of them are bloggers or different people on there. So he's got it up there and he's got these two big screens and he's going to demonstrate the new capability by talking to this colleague in Australia. Well, I had the problems with the mic. Steve Jobs is up there with a much more expensive venue than this and they can't get it to work. And it's not like a two minute, it takes about 20 minutes. He goes off stage, he talks to his tech guys, they come back on, he goes off again. The reason I know I wrote a blog about this because it, it kind of, it, it was a beautiful real world illustration of the concept. And he finally came back out and he said, look, here's the deal guys. My tech guys are telling me that I can't connect to him because you all have your laptops on. And you're blogging and stuff, and we, you know, it's basically if it's if if electrons were water, the pipe ain't big enough. Or so, turn off your faucets. And he had to come and say, "Okay, come on, some, turn off your computers." And I thought he's basically coming out and saying, "What I have to do is more important than what you're doing, so shut off your device." And of course, he was the main event, so he could do that. But it got me to thinking, what if one of the persons in the audience wasn't a blogger, wasn't that? Say he was a doctor say he was a cardiac doctor, and say he was on call for someone to, you know, for a heart to be available for a heart transplant or something, and he needs to get an immediate notification, or there's someone in the emergency room that needs his expertise like this. Well, what do we do here? 
In the real world, if you translate it to physical transportation, you give ambulances and police cars sirens and allow them to violate the normal laws of that and, and all, all other traffic is supposed to get out of the way. Should that be a thing in net neutrality? And how do you start prioritizing that in there? Uh, so even if you have that ubiquitous Wi-Fi, will we ever have enough capability to satisfy all the needs? Probably not. So who comes first on that? That, so that that's that's may not be the one that but that, that 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 you're talking about, but that's a very important uh, issue that among the many unanswered issues with cyberspace. Uh, with regard to the implants, um, I mean there there there's the capability already there. If you, you I'd written a paper uh, about two years ago and I started looking at just just went out and said what are some of the devices that are already implanted into the human body that could have a cyberspace connection? Well, one of the first that come to mind was cochlear implants, the ability to uh, connect to the the auditory nerve to allow people that could not uh, hear uh, to be able to hear with that. I said, well, you know, I work, you know, I go to work out or something, you know, listen to your music. Wouldn't it be, I mean, how many people you came up and said, you know what, we can put permanent microphone or, you know, headsets in your ears. You won't know that they're not that. There's actually research that can be done. They could be powered by your own body's uh, electromagnet or your, your electric field of your body, it, could, it, it wouldn't need batteries, it wouldn't need anything like it. You could just put it there and you could have your music on somebody else. And then it's like, well, why is something you carry around the music? Why don't you just put that on there? There's implants that, that, that can go into your fingertips to take blood pressure, that can measure different blood levels and stuff for diabetes, etc. So they're already out there. That one that I showed you here, they're looking at ways of, of implanting devices for doing med medicine, etc. Another thing they're looking at doing is ways of transmitting music and, and sharing uh, different uh, data requests. Um, we just had the Grammys, okay, so Adele is a big singer. You've heard, she, won, she came out with the armload of Grammys from that. So suddenly it's not surprising you'll see requests on different ways of buying music and stuff to maybe have an increase in that. But if they're going to the same sports, instead of 10 people going and saying, I want that music and download it, they started coming up with a way of saying, well, if this person requests that, and 25 milliseconds later, another person that's a mile away from them requests that, and say the servicing thing is 10 miles away, requests that, well, why can't they just piggyback off the download that they got? Instead of downloading it from the source there, they'll download it from that other. And this is a, a, a file share uh, a serving methodology that they're, they're using right now that speeds things up and, and, and cuts down on the amount of, of, air, of, of stuff that's, that's being done. Well, if you start bringing that to fruition, you don't have telepathy, but you have probably the closest you're going to get to that if you start interconnecting devices that may be implanted with people. And uh, talk about EJ's question about privacy. It, it, it creates a whole different uh, uh, area in there. And there's two ways of looking at that. I kind of put it into, for the classic literature, there's uh, the 1984, the, the Orwell world where the government can use that to you know look on everybody, or there's the, the brave new world, the Huxley world, which is where it's used to not necessarily another good thing, but to to uh, uh, enhance buying and selling of commodities and to uh, go after more hedonistic pleasures on that. Neither one is admirable, but they're both possible by some of the things on there. Uh, you can see now I say ethicists, philosophers, and so sociology, I think, need to be brought in to the concept of, of investigating cyberspace, not just the pure uh, technologist uh, on that. So. Back here first. Okay. okay. That last sentence of the part up there says something about influence uh, of like a force of nature. And I'm not aware of all of the implements of what comes out of uh, cyberspace if there's any force that comes out of outer space that can pollute our outer space or affect our weather. Or what about all of this trying to get rid of all of these devices and we put them in um, dumps? What, what, what can be the effect of them? Okay. No, it's, um, and someone else had talked to me a little bit about that at the break. That's um, one would be about, I guess, what I meant by the statement here is looking at cyberspace itself and almost like the how it's. Um, day-to-day -day form would almost be like a force of nature if you would if you looked at that 
that that the way that virus spread across her. It's almost like tidal waves or oops, sorry, ebbing and flowing uh, of of different items on there. Um, it's not a simple answer, but but it would be it would be more like a force of nature than just a mechanical program running because so many different things are going to be integrating. It's going to become very complex and. Uh, kind of like the weather, you can kind of get—I mean, you can kind of get an idea on gross weather trends. But when is the weatherman ever right consistently? It's just like can, I think cyberspace is going to get to that point where you're not going to be able to define, you're not going to be able to to relate it on there, and not know what's actually available at any given point because there's so many different uh, requests being made and information being given out that it that it that it's shifting almost instantaneously, in fact, faster than instantaneously. But that's a whole other. Uh, a concept on that, but getting back to how that now influences the, the more the physical world, that's another area that's being overlooked. Uh, the ecological aspects of it, you know, the stewardship of resources. Um, one of the questions that you brought about what happens when we get these devices and they're and they're used and we want to throw them away. I mean, it, it is funny that something that was state of the art, you know, like 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 an iPhone that the first one, well, who wouldn't? You know, now it's a piece of junk, right? Well. You know, a couple of years ago, you see people lined up outside, you know, in, in the freezing cold of Northern California, <laughs> but wait, you know, waiting a block line long to go in there and slap down a couple, you know, hundred bucks to buy this new device, and now it's a, a piece of junk. But those things, yeah, add up, and they do have lithium batteries. They have, they have uh, properties in there. I know there are some programs. I think there's some right in, I think, or Lancaster or Cumberland. I can't remember that that is run by I think the prison system that recycle some of the, you know, tries to, to take out the scrap and recycle some of the systems on there. Uh, so there are ways of doing that. But one of the ecological things that I wasn't aware of until I saw a, uh, a briefing and the gentleman just happened to touch on it real quickly and he said, you know, he was showing how cyberspace had grown, the use, the use and the number of people and all that, but he also said that at that point, and I think it was back in about 2008, that uh, computer resources, telecommunication devices used about 5% of the power generation of the planet. And I started thinking about that, and I thought about dorm rooms and, and moving the kids into college and things like that. And all the colleges had to upgrade their systems because they were not designed to have, you know, my, my son's computer right now, he's in a, in a computer, he's, he's studying computer engineering technology, but his, uh, the, the, the system he's built takes 700 watts. That's the power supply that's on it. And I showed, showed him and said, Dan, this is, this is a little heater I use down in the basement. Its first setting is 600 watts <laughs> to generate heat. But this can be, so yeah, I, I don't think anyone's looked at the, the stewardship aspect of that is just from a resource, how much resources are they, are they consuming? Um, the energy it puts out as far as a, the airways and stuff, uh, there's been some postulation is that the exposure that can that have, uh, you know, cell phones can that cause brain cancer and things like that. Uh, the jury's still out on that, but the bandwidth itself, the frequencies and the the, the 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 frequencies that people are able to operate the systems on are a limited resource, and that's something in uh, for satellite communication that is that is regulated by a, a, a committee within the United Nations, and um, so it's something that that it's not a an, an inexhaustible system. Although they may find other ways of doing uh, of making the connections on that. So I think I just when you start getting into that, looking at the that cyberspace as a, as as a as a whole, those are issues that are going to come up. You don't see them as much now because everybody's just trying to make something a little bit faster, or a little bit more memory, a little bit cheaper, and not looking at the long range uh, aspects. But again, that's where cyberspace is no different than a lot of what we're doing with air or water or land pollution and. You know the the controversy just in Pennsylvania with fracking. You know, the getting the, the, the with getting the oil shale out, and uh, I'm saying there's a lot of issues on on both sides of that. Uh, it's a it's a it's an opportunity, but it also has some uh, some uh, problems with environment. So, I. Uh, I'd like to follow up on your your question, uh, your answer to the question on the policy of, of conducting uh, offensive cyber warfare. Uh, does that mean that, if I got you right, the, uh, the DOD is not developing, it doesn't have a mandate to develop an offensive cyber warfare capability? And two related things to that. Uh, are we, are we not conducting offensive cyber warfare in the war on terrorism? 
which is sort of a semi-declared war. And has anyone within DOD uh, argued for or against uh, coming up with a Manhattan Project or uh, for uh, cyber warfare? It seems to me, to give you my bias, that uh, this is an area where we should have an offensive capability and we shouldn't wait to the last minute uh, to develop it, even though we are developing it to some degree doing defensive things. Okay, uh, well, let's see if I can not dodge your question, but also not get myself in trouble. So let's see. Uh, of course, any aspects of dealing with the development I can't comment on in this forum. But if you were to look into, you know, certainly the computer network attack is, is a definition that's in joint public, joint doctrine. General Alexander has talked about that uh, in there. And you mentioned about the Manhattan Project uh, type approach to, that's been proposed for other areas of cyberspace by many, many venues uh, uh, in the greater metropolitan DC area on that, bringing together a lot of the, the best and the brightest uh, to do that. Um, so it, it, there's nothing veiled about you know, the, the, the areas of operation right now in cyberspace and collectively they come under what's called CNO, computer network operations, or the computer network exploitation, which is going out and gathering information, uh, espionage, and espionage again is, is not illegal and all there are legal ways of doing espionage if it's agreed, you know, are doing over, looking into other, other countries. We do that cooperatively with certain things like Open Sky and some of the treaty uh, things that come under the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. Um, there's Computer Network Defense, CND, and that's probably the one you hear the most about, and that's ways of trying to keep the bad guys out and trying to keep that technology and sharing that with industry uh, and uh, uh, some of the way that the military has shared that with the Department of Homeland Security, uh, and you can read about this on the White House uh, website, is a thing called the Einstein system, which is an intrusion detection system that helps to identify and, and stop and, um, um, people coming into the .gov uh, things and, and do exercises such as CyberStorm, and I think they just finished up the third one last September. The Department of Homeland Security has conducted a series, uh, I don't know where they are in the planning stage for the next one, but it's activity called CyberStorm. They invite uh, not just other agent member, other departments, other agencies, but they also include um, uh, private industry, uh, academic, and international organizations as well, and they come up with scenarios and, and work together as how they would, would, would do that on there. Right, and, it, and there is CNA, com Computer Network Attack, which is again recognized in, 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 in at least in joint doctrine, and, and General Alexander has, has talked about that capability does exist. Um, for speculation, I mean, I, I can't really talk more about it beyond that. If you want to look, one, one person's opinion was uh, um, Richard Clark, who was a former security advisor for, um, I, I believe it was Clinton and Bush uh, for, in some case. But he has a book that just came out uh, about a year and a half ago um, where he talks about some of the more speculations on uh, computer network attack issues on that. Um, to be honest, I, I I don't really I have not looked looked into that much aspect, and the stuff was stuff we couldn't talk about publicly in there. You can look back on some of the uh, General, General Alexander and some of his congressional testimony, just talk in limited areas about that. That would be a mission that if the that the president decided to do that, it would probably come for to uh, General Alexander to implement through the U.S. Cyber Command. I was wondering if there's any more concern about our satellites in relation to uh, cyberspace uh, security. We have a lot of satellites up there and we have a lot of friends now who are putting up satellites, although our space program is not real viable at this point, but is there a connectivity uh, between our ground instruments, so to speak, uh, and then the satellites themselves? Um, yes, there is, uh, and and I, I heard my bio. One of the things I did do for uh, when, when I was active duty, I had a, a squadron out of Vandenberg Air Force Base, and and we trained 
the satellite command and control operators that carried out operations at what is National River Air Force Base in Colorado Springs. And a lot of the you know, satellites just don't operate on their own. They, they, they have to be monitored. They, there's a lot of commands that are, that are sent up to them on a regular basis to make sure they're healthy, make sure they're doing the right mission, they are in the right aspect and attitude they need to be um, uh, for, for given operations. And the way they do that is you know, through, through, through radio signals that, that go up uh, from different ground stations on that. And they are sent programs to operate data. So it is already in, in the cyber there. Um, so there, the vulnerability is there, the possibility is there, and there's a lot of different ways of, of, of doing, of, of looking at doing that. Sometimes just anywhere from the, just the more brute force of trying to jam it or something or going in. I think what you're talking about is more actually going in and trying to send up bad, bad data to it or something that way. Um, I'd refer you back in uh, October, November of last year, um, the, uh, there's, there's an annual report that goes to Congress, the uh, U.S.-China uh, Security and Economic Commission reports annually around the late October, early November time frame. And their report this last year talked about that very issue and about some uh, alleged uh, situations where China may have been uh, looking at, at developing capabilities or testing capabilities to do that. Um, there have been cases in the past, when I talked about the U.N., um, the UN uh, uh, regulating uh, some of the aspects of communication satellites. They actually assigned through the the ITU, uh, the Inter International Telecommunications Union, I believe. The, I know that I know that the letters, but not the, the the name for certain off 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 the top of my head. But they actually assign all the slots that are around the geosynchronous belt. That 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 belt where satellites, once they're out there, they stay in the same position relative, you know, to to a, a place above the Earth very valuable commodity for communication satellites because they can see one third of the earth and if you're trying to bounce signals back and forth and there was a case back in the 80s or 90s where a country had jammed another on that and these are documented I, something again I could give you very readily if I've used in my uh, um, space uh, space lesson development material but uh, the, the one that's been most recent and it was in some other areas uh, reported uh, is also in, in some uh, public public documents presented to Congress that, that do address that. So it is feasible and there is some allegations that that may be indeed uh, occurring. Hey, 